I am awake. I am alive. I am well. All things work together for my good. Let's go. I'm Canadian. <laughs> you are victorious. Now, we've been talking about being fortified. And fortified can look like being impenetrable by the enemy. And our theme verse, and I, I keep trying to get through this series, and either the Lord just shows up mightily at a service, and I can't get through it, and even today, not that much time, but uh, where Jesus said, the enemy came and found nothing in me, meaning nothing that he could latch on to. Jesus was impenetrable. The enemy couldn't have a hold in him. And I want you to know something. As hard as it is to believe, you, you are able to have and walk in everything that Jesus walked in. That is to say that you can remove, and the Holy Spirit helps to sanctify our lives to where the enemy doesn't have legal rights and a hold on our lives. Now, it doesn't mean we won't go through problems. It doesn't mean we won't be attacked or buffeted. The Scripture promises that. But the Scripture promises that in the presence of problems, God will give us supernatural peace. He'll give us supernatural peace. So I want to share a few secrets with you today, very simply. Uh, you know, we had a very big weekend last weekend. You guys must be just full right now of, of all kinds of good stuff. But along the lines of being fortified, it's God's will that we would have authority over uh, all the works of the enemy and that nothing would buffet us and nothing would take advantage of us and that we wouldn't give any legal grounds for the enemy to get in. And sometimes we think that the process of being a fortified believer, an impenetrable believer, looks like a lot of yelling, a lot of binding and loosing, and rebuking and shouting and sweating and, and a whole lot of work on our part. But I want to tell you a secret, and Jesus demonstrated it to us. Our greatest act of warfare against the enemy is total surrender to God. Safety and fortification is found through surrender. Dad used to talk about the toad in the lawn, on our front lawn. And that toad just lived there and scampered around the grass. And somehow, despite Dad mowing the lawn, <clears throat> couldn't seem to kill that thing. And he couldn't figure out how this toad was OK after a full and thorough lawn mowing. But the toad, for those of you here for the first time, you just must wonder about this church. <laughs> now he's talking about toads. But catch this. The toad knew that if he jumped and ran around shouting and yelling at the lawnmower, in all of his jumping, the blade would cut, cut him. So the toad understood that the safest posture that he could have was to not move, not jump, not run, not fight, but go low. So the toad would just crouch down, and it's even scriptural, uh, until destruction passes by. And I have seen over the years, there's a time to go low. Humility is a massive weapon of warfare. Honor is a massive weapon of warfare. And it's important to know when it's time to surrender. Not to surrender to the devil. Not to surrender to that mother-in-law 
or aunt or uncle that doesn't know boundaries. Uh, that's not the time to surrender. But the time to surrender to God and submit yourself to him. It's the safest place you can be, isn't it? In total surrender. Lord, I can't do this on my own. And we surrender. Now, what are we surrendering? What does that look like? I'll tell you. It looks like surrendering our will. Our will. And Jesus demonstrated this, didn't he? You want to know the mistakes I would have made if I was Jesus? Number one, I would have slipped into protest mode and I would have, I would have forget the 12, I'll take the 5,000 that I just fed so they owe me and we'll march on the Roman Empire <laughs> and we'll film it <laughs> and we'll protest. But instead, you see Jesus fulfilling the prophecy of like a sheep before his shearers was silent. And he stands before the government and Pilate says, don't you know that I can take your life from you? I can, we can kill you. Why don't you fight? Why don't you say something? And Jesus says, ah, uh, sorry. I need to just correct you a little there. Nobody takes my life from me. I surrender. Powerful thought. And he surrendered all the way to the cross. Why? It wasn't about being a pushover or lacking boundaries, but he certainly wasn't screaming about his rights. I mean, if anyone could have gone to human resources, it was Jesus. <laughs> but he surrendered unto death only, only, here's the important part, only, this is our anchor, because not my will be done, but your will. So we're surrendering our will for God's will. Not always easy, is it? But it's the safest place you can be. I don't know if you're familiar with the story about the pilot that had become disoriented while flying at night. And they have something called, not, not traffic control, mission control, or who is it that radios to the air traffic control? So you've got the voice of the Holy Spirit, I mean the voice of air traffic control, that's going to talk him through this. And he had actually, because he was flying at night, he had become so disoriented that he, he no longer was able to tell if he was seeing stars or city lights. And he actually, you know, was upside down at one point. And, and there came a time where he was absolutely sure that the city lights were stars. And he was going to fly towards the stars thinking he's going to avoid hitting city lights. So he's got it upside down. Air traffic control is saying and doing everything possible to point out his blindness. But he is sure that he has it correct. After all, He's the, one, he's the pilot of his life. I mean, his plane. He's sure he's got it right. He's 99% sure. But you can't give him 100% because no matter what car you drive in, there's always a blind spot. I don't know if you're hearing me this morning. And oftentimes, the disadvantage that you have as the pilot, how many are pilot of their own life? All of your hands should go up. Like, you know, the angels didn't make my toast this morning unless you call Sarah an angel. <laughs> but, you know, you're, you're, the, you're responsible for your own life. Is it, is it true? So who would know better than you? The problem is, 
when you're the pilot, you're at a disadvantage because you tend to think you know best. And what happens is we slip into our will. Do you know how powerful your will is? <laughs> One of the greatest and most loving things that God the Father ever did was give you free will. He didn't make you a robot. And as much as you invite him to be a pilot and, and make me a robot, he won't do it because to love someone is to give them free will. But the free will mechanism comes with a, a, a user error. <laughs> Our free will comes with a user error. You know what that is? You can be wrong. <laughs> you can be wrong. And I'll raise you. It gets worse. You can become your, your mechanism, your engineering, your ability, your mind can become rusty and dirty with pride. And pride can start to corrode your mechanism to where you think for sure you're going the right direction. And you're putting all of your willpower into going this way, but in fact, you're wrong. Think about that. That it's possible that we have blind spots in our lives, and so we live with an interdependency on God. Because we know that we can miss it. We have a strong will. Ask my mom which child, my sister or I, had the strong will. You ask her. Ask my kindergarten teacher. Well, ask all my teachers. My strong will needed to be curbed and harnessed. Because too much power without boundary, you can drive right off the cliff. Powerful vehicle, but out of control. And so we have a will that can take us the wrong direction. And our will, when we will against God, or we, we don't act like Jesus, where Jesus said, Father... If you can get me out of this, then do it. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. If we have a strong will going the wrong direction, not even God can help you. It's your will that takes you into hell. It's your will that takes you away from certain things. And this pilot was sure he knew better and wouldn't submit to traffic control for whatever reason. Usually it's pride. And he flew into the buildings and was killed, thinking they were the stars. The safest place we can be in our lives to be most fortified is, Lord, I surrender. Not my will, but your will be done. The only real power that the devil has over you is the power that you give him. Surrender will deliver you. Surrender will save you. God puts you in family to help curb your will. God puts you in family to help curb your will. God puts you in a church you know why people go from church to church to church, some of them? It's because once there's a clash of will, they go on to the next place where they're not known. And then there's another clash of will. And you've got somebody flying their plane that doesn't want the will of the Father for their lives and through leadership. For me, the first place I learned about will... <laughs> was the Garden of Gethsemane called I Have Parents. 
I had parents. And I had a strong will, and dad knew that it could kill me. And so because he loved me, he said no to me. Do you have anybody in your life that can say no to you? Do you have air traffic control? Do you have a pastor? Do you, do you have leadership? Do you have peer influence? All of those things make for healthy lifestyle. And I've watched this over and over again. People who want the blessing of God and want to build this and do that, but they have no air traffic controller. And they have, they're not submitted to any leadership. So they're unfortified, and God can't use them. So as a child, uh, I had this habit of wanting to demonstrate my will. Now, I, I, I don't want to burst your bubble of how holy you think I might be, but uh, I would grit my teeth at my dad. Arr. Actually, it sounds pretty crazy now that I talk about it out loud on the mic. Arr. Grit my, my teeth. I'm a bit embarrassed telling this story suddenly. Is my mom watching? <laughs> <laughs> I'd grit my teeth. Now, this was the days when you could spank your children. <laughs> this was these days. And uh, we were getting ready to go on something, a family trip or something, and I was... Rrr. And, uh, and Dad went and got the wooden spoon. I normally got the belt, so the wooden spoon was a good day. <laughs> but uh, he took the wooden spoon, and he had never done this, and he never did it since. But I'll never forget it. And he made me put out my hand, and he... Whap! <laughs> I see a lot of excited parents in the room. We should be careful here. Whap! It hit me on the hand. And, and, I, and you know what I did? Because I felt him exerting his will, my default was to exert my will even stronger. You ever met somebody like that? Don't turn to your neighbor. Don't turn to your spouse. But I, I thought I'll grit my teeth even harder. And you know, we do this with God. We do. We do this with our pastors. We do this with air traffic control. The people that God puts in our lives. And sometimes I want to say to a person, you know what? Your argument would be great. And I say this carefully because I'm a guy that just, you go do what you want. Our, our, our leaders kind of know that. But I want to say to them, you know what, if you were my pastor, this might be a better argument, but God put you here under my care, and I care about you, and I'm concerned about your stubborn will. Lovingly. And I, and I almost never have a conversation with someone like that. And you're free, you're free to go do what you want, but I have learned not to minimize the people God brings into our lives to recognize who you end up with, who you're ordained with, who are your mentors. How do we know those who labor among us? And so I grip my teeth even harder. And, and now I'm not even going to talk. I'm going to punish Dad with the silent treatment. All right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to punish... I, th this service is over. Uh, <laughs> I'll just wrap it. What are we at? I'll just wrap it up. I'm going to punish dad with the silent treatment. And so I'm silent and I'm just going to grit my teeth at him. And he hits me again harder. And I grit my teeth harder. And now it's a battle of wills. The only problem is I'm the loser <laughs> because he's my authority. And God is trying to help me because I'm flying into the buildings and thinking they're stars. And so 
he hits again. And at one point, because how many know silent treatment is very loud? Stonewalling. It's actually manipulation. And I grit my teeth and I don't say a word. And dad speaks and he says, I'm going to beat it out of you, this rebellion. Now that's shocking. Don't go home and do that. Pastor Doug is in heaven, so. And he never did it before and he never did it since. But I never forgot it. And there was something about his care and love and authority. My chin began to quiver. I'm trying to hold my will up. I will beat you, Dad. And I know the lines are blurry if you've come from abuse. Because it's hard to tell the difference if you've been abused, isn't it? A stern voice can be heard ten times louder. Correction can be perceived as control. We have all of these things in our generation, don't we? We've been a broken generation. But if you can work on it and build trust and see that air traffic control doesn't want to yell at you, they want to save your life because they see what you don't see. It's the way it is with God in our lives. He sees what we don't see. We think we know everything. Our pride gets in the way. And we don't realize how unfortified we are against the enemy. We're running out into enemy territory, unprotected, uncovered, no weapons. And we're screaming. And let me tell you, that's not the time to, to try to teach you to listen to the still, small voice of the Lord. <laughs> Shiloh, I'm yelling at you because I don't want you to run into traffic. God's voice is most fierce and loud and corrective when he knows that if we get our own way, it will kill us and he loves us too much. So he sends authorities into our lives and he puts us in family. Then my chin began to quiver. And then a little tear. And I tried to cover the tear. My will be done. And you know what happened? I broke. My spirit didn't break. My soul didn't break. My will, my rebellion was broken that day. Something changed that day. And I learned what it meant to be under somebody, to submit my will to somebody. I learned in that moment. Now, there are lots of other learning curves along the way. We have to be careful as we fortify our lives against the spirit of offense. Because I could have become offended with dad. And one thing you learn about offense is offense and resentment go hand in hand. When we have to do what we don't want to do, we can resent someone, can't we? Resentment is a, is a poison that can get into your soul. And it'll corrupt you. You'll miss out on blessings. Oh, you'll have your resentment, but you'll miss out on everything else. And if you allow resentment to bloom, you've become unfortified and the enemy can get into your life. And if you allow resentment to really bloom, you'll slide into something called resistance. Resistance. Resistance looks like stonewalling. I'll just remove myself. Uh, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> All of it sounds like the same, doesn't it? It all, it all sounds and looks the same. My, my will, I demand respect, you know, all of these kinds of things. And if you don't deal with resistance, you will slide into revenge. And that's when it's toxic. That's when it's toxic. Now, I finished this morning 
So those are the three R's. You can write them down. Resentment, resistance, and revenge. And no, nobody likes to get rid of their resentment, do they? For some reason, we like to hold on to it. <laughs> Our will. There was a CEO who had to go up to the top of a, a building where his office was. And he would take the elevator to get up to the top. And when he got in at a certain floor and was going to ride to the top, he could hear two of his subordinates all of a sudden stop talking. They were kind of whispering, and then they stopped talking. And he got in there, and he was offended. He was sure they were talking about him. <laughs> he was sure they stopped talking. Everything looked like they were against him. And so he decides, because now he's feeling resentful, he goes into resistance mode, and he says, well, I'm not even going to greet them. I'm gonna, in fact, I'm going to stand on this side of the elevator. It sounds petty, but you ever been in church? I'm going to stand over here. And I'm not even going to say a word, and it's going to be their loss. And what you don't realize is you're the only one losing. Life goes on without you. You're not such a big deal. Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> and the resistance is building. He's mad. He can't get it out of him. And so he stops the elevator at a particular floor and gets out and won't even ride with them to the top, up to the top floor. So now they get the comfortable ride, but he has to sweat it out by going up the stairs. And this is in the name of my will. I'm resisting. They don't deserve to ride with me. And he makes it up to the top floor, and he stews on this all day. He's crabby with clients. He's short with people. He's stewing. He can't, he can't get rid of it. He's become unfortified. The enemy is speaking words into his mind. They were talking about you. Who else were they? What else were they saying? Who else knows about it? Was that that guy that I came to the company picnic and I didn't like his awful wife? And, and this person is doing this and there's rebellion there. How do I get rid of the rebellion? And those two guys, can I fire them? And, and then you talk to the secretary about them. And, and you go about your day this way. And at the end of the day... He comes down from the building and goes out into the parking lot and sees those two guys. And they're talking to each other again. And they're talking about me. I know it. And I saw that glance and I saw him sneeze. And it has to do with me. It's all about me. <laughs> so he slips from resistance into revenge. And he gets in his car, and it's rained that day. And there's a puddle, a nice pool right by those two guys. And he's so full of pride and self-absorption and anger, and he's, he's just become toxic. And he drives through that puddle, soaks the two guys, absolutely splashes them, and drives off thinking, there, I think I'll feel better now. And the two guys, <laughs> and the two guys say, oh my gosh, what a jerk. Why are we planning a surprise birthday party for that man? Resentment and offense makes a mocker and makes a mockery of you. Nobody else loses but you. Lord, I give you my heart. Just say this with me. The good is not mine. The bad is not mine. All right, all right. Before we go, before we go. Who has a reason to be offended with someone? 
Who's lying? Let's do that one first. <laughs> Who, do you have a re- is there somebody in your life you have a reason? I, I have one. I, I, well, I've got a, I got a list. How many of you have a reason to be offended with someone? Like you have a right. You have a, come on. I want you to practice something. Are you ready? <laughs> the good is not mine. The bad is not mine. I surrender it. Oh, did you feel the atmosphere? Think of that person. Close your eyes as we close. Think of that person or people. If you're looking at me, I'll be worried that it's me. <laughs> close your eyes. Think of that person. Think of those people. Think of what they did to you. I want you to say this out loud. I forgive you. Say, I forgive them. And now say, the good is not mine. The bad is not mine. I surrender it all to God. Amen. Give the Lord a clap offering today. Wow, amazing word, amazing word. How many people received that today? Oh, it's nice to hear that. So a couple of reminders. Remember the discipleship tier one. Please sign up and attend. It starts this Wednesday. And uh, 7.30 start time, same Zoom link as the church link. And 